Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today we'll read from a book titled Growing Up Modern uh, Childhoods in Iconic Homes uh, by Julia Jambrosik and Corinne Kempster, published by Birchhäuser. Historians have called the Schminke House unrestrainedly modernist and a pioneering work of organic architecture. The house coalesced Hans Scharun's idea and design methodologies related to domesticity and was the architect's final project before Nazi restrictions limited his freedom of formal experimentation. Fritz and Charlotte Schminke became acquainted with Scharun's work at the 1929 Deutscher Werkbund sponsored Bonn und Werkraum Ausstellung living and workspace exhibition in Breslau. There they saw the Hostel for Unmarried Workers, a programmatically and architecturally innovative housing project designed by the architect, who was also a professor at the city's university. Unlike his contemporaries Walter Gropius and Mies, who pursued a more rationalist design founded on structural logic and pure orthogonal geometries, Sharun approached the Schminke House as an experimental sequence of spaces. Despite its openness, this is not a general-purpose flexible plan in the Miesian sense, but rather a series of dedicated rooms visually and spatially linked, Peter Blondell Jones states. Accommodating the needs of the family through a series of interconnected rooms, the Schminke house emerged from the inside outwards, as it also adapted to the existing stepped topography of the site. As a result, the house appears grounded and embedded from the south and lighter, almost floating, to the north where it faces the garden. Sharun, who himself grew up in the port city of Bremerhaven, brought to the project a series of nautical references and structural techniques. These included not only circular windows and patterns, but also more fundamentally a steel frame construction that allowed the house particular openness and enabled its characteristic horizontal cantilevers. Sharun's pursuit of the ship-like was no mere affectation. It provided a radical alternative to the prevailing building culture both visually and technologically. A distinctive design aspect of the Schminke House is the 26-degree angle defined by the entry stairway and carried forward in the rotation of the winter garden and the service area volumes that accentuate the extremities of the house. On the interior, the rotation enables a particular fluidity between spaces that extends out toward the garden. Despite the relative lack of attention devoted to Sharun in canonical architectural history, the Schminke House remains one of the most singular and significant examples of modernist domestic architecture. In its use of bold color, its sensitivity to sight and the experience of movement it enables, the house makes a unique and complex contribution to modernism's legacy. The family left uh, the home in 1951, after which it became a clubhouse for the socialist youth movement Freie Deutsche Jugend and then an East German pioneer house. It was renovated and reopened as a museum in 2000. Helga Zumpfe, ne Schminke, was nearly three years old when her family of six moved into the Schminke house on May 31, 1933. In total, she lived in the dwelling for 15 years and she remembers it fondly. Her childhood experiences of the home, including her memories of its open and airy expanses and the friendship her family developed with Sharun, were formative for her. Born in 1930, Helga was the youngest of Charlotte and Fritz Schminke's four children. Although the family lived in the modernist house from 1933 until 1951, all six Schminke's enjoyed it together for only one year. In 1934, Harald moved to Dresden to complete his high school diploma. He was enlisted in 1939 and died on the Russian front in 1943. Helga's father was largely absent after 1938 because of his involvement in the Sudetan crisis and World War II, during which he fought as a reconnaissance pilot and made only occasional visits home.
Sharon became a close friend of the Schminke family through the house design and construction and would spend time in Lubao over the years. The Schminke house is situated in Kirsch Alley 1B on a plot of land of the family's pasta factory complex, Anker Teigwaren, which Fritz inherited when he was 21 years old. In the 1930s, the small street led only to the fields and farms where the family got their milk. Outdoor spaces form an integral part of the experience of the house, and for Mrs. Zumpfe, they were the site of many memories. There was a small bridge with a Sharoon-designed white bench between the large pond and its smaller, more overgrown counterpart where the children often played. Another zone dedicated especially to the children was found uh, on the southwest side of the house, past the cantilevering entrance canopy and by the factory wall. Here, under the sprawling chestnut tree, was a large square sandbox, a swing and gymnastics equipment. There was also a little undulating truck built on a tan-colored brick base, an apparatus invented and designed by Sharun with the children in mind. Helga and her siblings would sit in wagons not much larger than a shoebox and roll down the miniature roller coaster. Closer to the house itself, adjoining the glazed zone of the winter garden to the south and the north, are brick-paved patios, extensions of the house used as additional areas for informal play. Inside the dwelling, the children moved about freely, and not only between the playroom and their bedrooms, they truly partook in and even shaped the life of the entire house. The house was generous, and also for us children, always open and accessible, Mrs. Zunfer recalled. The lower level, with its particularly spacious living quarters, was a place where she remembers spending a lot of time. The first space access from the main entrance is a double-height hall, a pivotal space in the house where the living and service spaces cross and the diagonal stair ascends to the bedroom level above. The hall spills into the children's playroom to the south and the dining room to the north, with both spaces joining fluidly and contributing to the house's emblematic openness. The dramatic angle of the stair was less significant to Helga as an organizational mechanism, however, than as a means to provide a long balustrade to slide down for fun. The children's playroom is at the core of the house, immediately to the right of the main entrance, and is one of the first spaces encountered by a visitor. The central placement of this room elevated the position of the children within the hierarchy of the home, giving them prominence and celebrating their presence. Several specific moments in the playroom stand out. A large chalkboard on the west wall was used for drawings and later for homework. And each child had a cubby in the adjacent built-in shelves and storage. Stacked vertically, the cube spaces had doors that were each painted a different color. Mine was yellow, Mrs. Zumfer recalled, and appropriately for the youngest child, it was at the very bottom. In the playroom, running along the large window subdivided by a grid of mullions, is a wide window sill low enough that it could be used by the children for play. Historical photographs show Helga and Erika sitting on the ledge on small tonnet chairs. The sill also allows access to two square operable windows through which the children would clamber outside. This placement of the windows was not coincidental, as similar windows in the living room and winter garden are positioned much higher. Rather, the architect intentionally created opportunities for the children to manipulate and influence their surroundings, literally linking the inside and outside world for them. Another special instance of Sharun's child-focused design are the pairs of colored pieces of glass set into the metal frames of the exterior doors at a child's eye level. These colored portholes were placed strategically so that one could look through as a child and always see the world in a different color. 
the doors were a magical experience for the children, turning their view orange, amber, red and blue. Sharun's design does incorporate curtains to create more intimate conditions in the living spaces if desired. The curtains along the facade would be closed in the living room on winter evenings when the board games and music were played and the family read out loud by the fireplace. A thick interior curtain could also separate the playroom from the rest of the double height entry hall. In Mrs. Zumfe's memories, however, this curtain was usually drawn back so that the children could play everywhere. Visiting the house as an adult, Mrs. Zumfe particularly appreciates the winter garden. It was very special, she emphasized. Here the family often took their meals and had Easter breakfast at a festively set table. In the winter garden, beside the round table and its mis-designed red-painted metal tube chairs, was a bird cage with many small birds. Charlotte's photographs showed the girls playing in the sunken zone of the garden among the plants. Upstairs, the bedrooms of the children are very small, especially by today's standards, and in their layout are reminiscent of the sleeping cabins of a ship. Sharun included a wall of built-in wardrobes in the generous hallway outside the bedrooms, so the rooms function primarily as places to sleep. Each of the two children's room originally had a pair of beds that folded up against the wall, like in a cabin of a ship. One of the rooms was later transformed into a bedroom for Harold, the oldest and the only boy, and as a result, the girl's bedroom gained a space subtracted from Harold's room as an additional sleeping nook. It was a very small space where we slept, uh, Mrs. Zumpfe confirmed. In fact, during the war, while her father was away, she slept in his bed in the parents' bedroom so that the others could have more space. People walking down the Kirsch Alley always looked inside uh, to the very open interiors, as the curtains were rarely closed. The neighbors gave the house the nickname Noodle Dampfer, Noodle Steamer, alluding to the pasta factory and the ship-like form and nautical references of the architecture. As a child, Mrs. Zumfe was not aware of the building's architectural significance or its avant-garde characteristics. This awareness came only much later, once she had moved. It was simply where we lived, she said. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.